As you already know, buffers are solutions that resist changes in pH with the additions of acid or base. They have their limitations, though, and in this PowerPoint, we'll examine the limits of buffer range and capacity. Even the most effective buffer can be overcome if you add too much acid or base. So here we see a buffer with an initial pH of 8. The yellow color reflects the acid base indicator methyl orange, which is yellow in basic pHs. Now if you add a little acid to the buffer, the pH does drop a little bit, but not too much. The extra acid is neutralized by reaction with the weak base present in the buffer. But as you continue to add acid, it continues to react with the weak base that's present, converting it into the base's conjugate acid. And eventually, if you add enough extra acid, it will consume all the weak base present in the buffer. There will be nothing left for that acid to react with, and any additional acid will cause a dramatic shift in the pH, as in this final picture. A lot of acid has been added to the beaker at this point. Notice the change in volume here in this final picture. Notice that the color has changed to red, which is what we expect for methyl orange in acidic solutions. And take a look at the actual pH reading on the Veneer LabQuest. It's 1.53, well below where it was originally. In this scenario, we've exceeded the capacity of this buffer. Buffering capacity is ultimately determined by the absolute amounts of weak acid and conjugate base present. More concentrated buffers can neutralize more added acid or base than a dilute buffer. This is just because there's more of the weak acid or the conjugate base to actually react with what's ever added. One question that we want to answer relative to buffering capacity is how much the pH might change when an acid or a base is added. Say we add 15 milliliters of a 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide solution to 100 milliliters of a buffer that is 0.1 molar acetic acid and 0.1 molar sodium acetate, its conjugate base. The original pH of this buffer solution is 4.74. We want to know what would happen to the pH after the base reacts with the buffer components. So we can figure this out as long as we know uh, the final concentrations of the buffer components. We could use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, but we have to figure out how much of the acid reacts with the base and how much of the conjugate base will be formed as a result. So we break this type of problem into two parts. The first is a stoichiometry calculation between our added base, the sodium hydroxide, and the buffer acid, abbreviated HA here. This will help us know how the moles of our buffer acid decrease after reaction with the base, and the moles of our conjugate base, the sodium acetate, that will form. We can then use those new moles to calculate the new pH of the solution using the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So we'll start with the stoichiometry calculation. And uh, we need for any stoichiometry problem to have a balanced chemical equation. So in this case, the balanced chemical equation is associated with uh, the reaction between our base, sodium hydroxide, and it's going to react with the acid in the buffer solution because bases and acids react together. So we write the equation for this reaction. Sodium hydroxide plus acetic acid produces water, since uh, this is an acid-base neutralization reaction. Water is always going to be one of the products. And it also produces sodium acetate, which is our conjugate base. This is what's left over after the hydroxide and the hydrogen um, combine to make water. We're left with sodium and acetate ion. So we want to begin by figuring out how many moles we have of each of our substances initially. So we calculate the moles before reaction for each of our solutions. 
And we know that moles for a solution is simply equal to the volume of that solution in liters times the molarity of that solution. So we can use that calculation for all of our different substances here. For sodium hydroxide, we have 15 milliliters, which is the same as 0 0.0150 liters times the concentration of the sodium hydroxide solution, 0 0.10 moles per liter. And we end up with 0 0.0015 moles of sodium hydroxide available for reaction. We do the same thing for our buffer acid. The acid, we have 100 milliliters of our buffer solution, so that's 0 0.1 liters times our concentration of the acid originally, and we end up with 0 0.01000 moles of acetic acid available for reaction. And of course, for the sodium acetate, our uh, conjugate base, we do the same calculation. We have the same volume present, and we actually have the same concentration. Now, we're going to show how the moles change during reaction. Since we have uh, the smallest number of moles associated with our sodium hydroxide, um, and we know that this is a strong base, it's going to react completely with our acid. And so we can subtract um, this number of moles from our sodium hydroxide. So 0 0.0015 minus 0 0.0015 is going to leave me with 0 moles of sodium hydroxide after the reaction. Now, according to the balanced chemical equation, it's a 1 to 1 mole relationship for sodium hydroxide and acetic acid, as well as a 1 to 1 relationship with sodium acetate, our product. It's one coefficient in front of all of those, which means that if I react um, 0.0015 moles of sodium hydroxide away, I'm also going to react that amount of acetic acid away. So I subtract the same number from my acetic acid, and I get uh, 0.0085 moles of acetic acid that are left after reaction. And that acetic acid is converted to the conjugate base. So I increase my conjugate base concentration by 0 0.0015 moles. And I get my new um, amounts of moles of each reactant and product for calculating my Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. Now, it turns out that you can substitute the moles directly into the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. It is actually um, formulated for molarity, but the way the calculation works, um, if we're to calculate the actual new molarities, um, the volumes are going to end up canceling themselves out. So I'll just do the calculation with molarity first to show you how it's done and how the volumes uh, cancel out. So we'll calculate our final molarities for our acetic acid and our sodium acetate. So we divide the moles by uh, the total volume of solution after reaction. So we had 100 milliliters of the buffer to begin with, and then we added 15 milliliters of our base solution. So that's now 115 milliliters, or 0 0.115 liters. And it's the same volume for the uh, sodium acetate, our conjugate base. So we have our new molarities, and we can substitute these into our Henderson-Hasselbalch equation and calculate the new pH. All right, so our pKa for the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation is the negative log of the Ka value. In this case, uh, the negative log of 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. The Ka was actually given to us in the problem here. That equals 4.7447. We calculated the concentration of our conjugate base, and we also calculated the concentration of our weak acid after reaction with the sodium hydroxide. We're going to substitute these into our Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, and I'm going to substitute these in the form of the original ratio of moles per liter so that you can see that when we take the ratio of our base over our acid, the volume of the solution is actually going to cancel out. And that's the same, um, dividing by our molarities is going to be the same as dividing by the moles of our base over our acid. So while I went ahead and calculated the molarity to show you that this would work, um, you actually do not need molarity. You can stop once you've figured out the moles left after reaction of your weak acid and your conjugate base.
So we plug these into our calculator and we get 4.7447 plus 0 0.013128, which equals 4.8759. We round to the second decimal place to reflect our uh, significant figures in our uh, Ka value, and we end up with a final pH of 4.88. So a little bit higher than our original pH, but not too much. Let's look at another example. This time we're going to add 10 milliliters of an acid solution, 0 0.20 molar hydrochloric acid, to our buffer. And our buffer again is going to be 100 milliliters of an acetic acid and sodium acetate buffer that's 0.1 molar concentration for both the acid and the conjugate base. So that initial pH is going to be 4.74, and we want to figure out how the pH changes with the reaction, after the reaction with the added acid. So we'll do this in two parts again. First, we'll do the stoichiometry, then we'll do the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So this time, since we're adding acid, it's going to react with a conjugate base. So we write the equation for the reaction of the added acid with a conjugate base. So that means that we do the acid and the conjugate base on the reactant side. And how they will react, the um, base will extract the hydrogen from the acid. And so the hydrogen combines with the acetic acid, um, or excuse me, with the acetate ion to form as one of the products acetic acid. The other product is what's left over um, after the hydrogen has combined with the acetate ion, and that's a sodium and a chloride. So that forms a sodium chloride for our other product. Now we'll calculate the initial moles of each of these substances. So for hydrochloric acid, we have uh, 10 milliliters, so that's 0 0.01 liters, times our concentration, and that gives us 0 0.002 moles of hydrochloric acid. We do the same thing for our sodium acetate and our acetic acid. For both of these scenarios, we have 100 milliliters of our buffer solution initially, so that's 0.1 liters times the concentration, which is 0.1 molar for each, and we end up with 0 0.010 moles of each of those substances initially. Now, during the course of the reaction, we are going to react away all of the hydrochloric acid, since that's the one we have present in the least amount. That's our limiting reactant. So we um, subtract out uh, hydrochloric acid moles um, the 0 0.0020 moles. On the reactant side, we get 0 moles of hydrochloric left and 0 0.010 minus 0 0.0020, we end up with 0 0.0080 moles of our sodium acetate left. On the product side, we add so 0 0.010 plus that 0 0.0020 moles gives us 0 0.0120 moles of acetic acid. And now we can substitute these final moles after reaction directly into the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation to calculate the new pH. Okay, so our pKa is the negative log of our Ka, which is still 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5 for acetic acid. And our concentrations, we're just going to use the moles for our concentration values. For the base, it's decreased. For the acid, it has increased. So we substitute these into our Henderson-Hasselbalch, um, and we solve and we end up with our pH equal to, this time, 4.5686. We round to the second decimal place again, and we get 4.57 for our new pH. So it's a little more acidic after the addition of the acid, but not much. So if buffering capacity is determined by the absolute amounts of buffer acid and base, then the ratio of the two determines what we call the buffering range. 
So this is the pH range over which a buffer is considered effective. And up to this point, we've been dealing with buffers that are pretty much the same concentration of base over acid, so a one-to-one -one ratio. You can have some amount of variation in that, but as a general guideline, you have to have relatively equal concentrations so that you can resist changes of pH in any direction effectively. So effective buffers generally exist for base to acid ratios that fall between 10 and 0.1. So if we look at the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation and we substitute in these limits, 10 and 0.1, well, the log of 10 is plus 1. And the log of 0.1 is negative 1. And what this implies for us is that the uh, um, pH range, the effective pH range of any particular buffer is equal to the pKa value plus or minus 1. So within this range, there are relatively equal levels of acid and base. And outside of this range, you don't, just don't have enough of one component, either the acid or the base, to effectively buffer in both directions. This has important implications when it comes time to pick your acid and conjugate base or your base and conjugate acid system to make a buffer. You should always choose a combination in which the pKa of the acid is within one point of the desired pH for the buffer. Let's look at an example. So we want to make a buffer with a pH of 4.25. And the first step in figuring out how to make this buffer is actually to choose an appropriate weak acid and a salt of its conjugate base. So we'll start with the acid. Um, and what we want to do is pick a weak acid that has a pKa that's within one point of the final pH that we want, 4.25. So in this list of weak acids that are available to us, two of them fall within one point of 4.25, both nitrous acid and formic acid at 3.34 and 3.74 for their pKa's. Now, while both fall within the appropriate range and you could create the buffer with either one, if it's possible to use formic acid, it might be better. We might have a better buffering range because the pKa is actually closer to the final pH that we want. So now that we know the weak acid that we're going to use to make our buffer, we just have to figure out the ratio of its conjugate base to acid that's necessary to get that pH of 4.25. So we're going to use as our conjugate base sodium formate, the sodium salt to formic acid. And what we're really solving for here is the ratio of the concentration of base to acid, which is a component of our Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So we know pH of our final solution, we know the pKa, the only other factor that we don't know is that ratio. So we want to rearrange the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation to isolate that ratio. First step is to get the log term by itself, so we can subtract pKa from both sides. We end up with pH minus pKa equals the log of our ratio. Next, we want to get rid of the log. So uh, to get rid of a log, L-O-G, we raise everything to the base 10 on both sides of the equation, and it cancels out on the right, and we're left with um, our ratio by itself equals 10 raised to the exponent of the pH minus the pKa. So we substitute what we have into this expression, and we get our ratio is equal to 10 raised to the exponent of 4.25 minus 3.74. That difference is 0.51. And 10 raised to the 0.51 power gives us a value of 3.2. So we want 3.2 times uh, the concentration of our conjugate base, the sodium formate, to our formic acid concentration. 
And so the actual absolute concentrations um, can vary. So we could have one molar uh, formic acid and 3.2 molar of our sodium formate, or we could have 0.1 molar of our acetic acid and 0.32 molar of our sodium formate. Both scenarios would end up giving us a final pH of 4.25. So in summary, buffering capacity is the amount of added acid or base that a buffer can neutralize. It's determined by the absolute amounts of buffer acid and conjugate base present. And you can calculate changes in the pH of buffers with the addition of acid or base using stoichiometry and the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. And buffer range is the pH range over which a buffer is considered effective. It's determined by the ratio of base to acid, and it is the pKa plus or minus 1 of the buffer acid.